God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray for the gift of teaching now. Open my heart, my soul, and my mind to understand your Bible. And then, Father, I pray that you'd open the hearts of the people to receive the truth. May it fall on good ground, not among thorns and not on rocks, but good ground. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right, now turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. And uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 in one hand and 1 Thessalonians 4 in the other. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51. If you'll remember now, last week, I come down today, this will probably be the last lesson in the series on the rapture, second coming. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is a mystery that um, Martha in John chapter number 11 knew nothing about. If she had, it wouldn't have been a mystery. John 11 in verse number 24 the Lord said in verse 23, Thy brother shall rise again. Alright? Thy brother shall rise again. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. All right, now, of course, that's true, but there's more to be known than that. And the truth is that the church had not been revealed to Martha at that time, the body of Christ, and that uh, not knowing that, she, of course, would uh, not know that there would be a mystery associated or attached to the church that the folks in the Old Testament knew nothing about. The mystery was revealed in time in the, in the, in, in the, when God chose the time to reveal that to the Apostle Paul. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse 13 the Apostle said, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep. The scripture uses euphemisms all the time in reference to those who know the Lord and are departed. He didn't say concerning them which are dead because they're not dead. They that sleep in Jesus, verse 14, will God bring with him. All right? And uh, so, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, what you have here is, a, is the introduction of a mystery. Now, turn to the last chapter of the book of Acts. This happens along about 67, 8, 9 A.D., somewhere in that time period. I believe before 70 A.D., before Titus destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, for not one single reference is made in the book of Acts to that event, and that is a profound event, to destroy the temple in Jerusalem and drive the Jews from their homeland. In uh, Acts chapter number 28 and verse number 25, this scripture is quoted again. It's quoted seven times in the New Testament. And if you'll notice here in Acts 28, verse 25, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Now he quotes Isaiah 6, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go to this people, and saying, Hear ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now decree, this is a decree, verse 28, be it known. Therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. 
It doesn't mean that Jews could not be saved. It means that the direction and focus of the Holy Spirit now is Gentiles. And every generation will have Jews that are born again, for he makes that plain in Romans 11, that a remnant, a remnant will be born again, will be saved in Romans chapter number 11. If you'd like to turn over there. And uh, you'll find that... Uh, in verse 11, in Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 5, so then at this present time, and you could say this present time, regard if it's 1500 A.D. or if it's 2012 A.D., at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So Jews are being saved and have been for 2,000 years. But the scripture that he quoted, go back to Isaiah chapter number 6 now, and here's what he quoted. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is called by some the prince of the prophets. How many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? And how many books are there in the Bible? And how many, how many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. And if you look at the 39th chapter of Isaiah, You'll see that it is a historical record leading up to something. The 40th chapter of Isaiah opens up with verse 3, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Who's that? That's John the Baptist. So the book of Isaiah, strangely enough, is separated into two distinct categories. The first 39 chapters and then the last 27, which gives you 66 books. That's quite a coincidence, don't you think? <laughs> you have 66 books of Holy Writ, and you have 39 Old Testament and 27 New. You have 39 chapters in the, old, in the book of Isaiah leading up to the, uh, uh, through the historical record leading up to John the Baptist, because he is definitely the one talking about in the 40th chapter of Isaiah. That's quite a remarkable thing. And, uh, of course, Isaiah, Isaiah, it means Jehovah saves. That's what the book, that's what that name means. He's the Savior. Now, <laughs> in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, you have a prophecy that is quoted seven times in the New Testament. And each time this prophecy is quoted, now seven times is a lot to quote one prophecy. That's a lot, folks. Seven times. And each time it's quoted, it has something to do with Israel rejecting the Messiah. And uh, to me, this is not a coincidental thing. To me, it means that uh, God is going to deal with these people just like he said he would. But he has, he has he had for only a certain period of time. Just like the church age is going to come to an end, the fullness of the Gentiles will come about, and then the times of the Gentiles will be completed when God smites that image on its feet. I believe that we are living in what's called the terminal generation. This is the last one, right before he comes. Hal Lindsey, I think, used that term, didn't he, about 30, 40 years ago? The terminal generation. And I think the first book that Hal Lindsey wrote was The Late Great Planet Earth, I think. I'm not sure about that. And, uh, but in any event, he, uh, he mentioned the terminal generation, the generation here at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> there could be nothing outside of um, salvation that could be more wonderful to the mind of a Christian than to be living and see him come in power. That, that's, 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 uh, that's a remarkable thing. Now, in Isaiah chapter number 6, you have, uh, you have Isaiah is called the prince of the prophets because it is so full, so full of prophecies that relate to to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the people of God. Look at chapter number 9 of Isaiah. I'll just give you a couple. And verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born and a son is given. The son's not born, the son is given. See the wording? That's very powerful. Uh, the child is born because God took our humanity, but he didn't take our fallen nature. The son was given. Why was, he, why was he given? He wasn't born because he's from everlasting. He's eternal. He didn't come, he, the Son of God did not come into existence 2,000 years ago. The God-man did. So the, son, the, the child is born. 
<coughs> and it says plainly, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the what? And that agrees with uh, Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 8, the Almighty. Now, Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse number 14 Behold, therefore the Lord shall give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's a Hebrew name that means God is with us. And so who's the virgin? Mary. Mary. Uh, they have a song that's called Ave Maria. Uh, here's the problem with Mary. The Catholics go a little bit too far, and the Baptists don't go far enough. There's a problem with that. From this gener from the generations forward, they shall call me blessed. She's not a mediator. There's just one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. She's not to be worshipped. You worship God and God alone. But she does demand respect. And she's different from any other human being that ever lived on the face of the earth. She carried God in her womb for nine months and so uh, I've heard uh, I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of uh, denigrating uh, derogatory statements about her by some uh, Protestants and Baptists and what have you and I don't agree with it you should respect that name there's just one Mary so in Isaiah 7 14 she brought forth the virgin did the God man in the uh, the book of Isaiah therefore is full of this kind of uh, prophecy. The 40th chapter of Isaiah talks about the servant of the Lord. And the servant of the Lord is not John the Baptist. No, 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 no. No, no, no. The servant of the Lord that's found in the 40th chapter of Isaiah and in the 41st chapter and the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, in the 42nd chapter in verse 1 it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I've put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Who is that? That's, that's the Lord Jesus. And when he got up to read in uh, the synagogue there at, uh, at uh, Nazareth, they handed him the book of the law, and here's where he turned to. Look at Isaiah 61, the 61st chapter of Isaiah. So what you have here is him speaking directly. Isaiah is the voice of the Lord speaking directly. Isaiah 61.1 The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. All right? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year of Jubilee. There's a comma there. He stopped reading at that point. Isn't that amazing? He stopped right there, closed the book, and handed it back. Why didn't he continue to read? What follows is the day of vengeance of our God. What is that? That's the second advent as he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. He didn't come the first time to proclaim the day of vengeance. He came the first time to declare liberty throughout the land, the year of jubilee to set the captive free and to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils. And so what I just did for you is what he did. This is probably the most classic example in the whole Bible of rightly dividing the word of truth. Think about it for a moment. If he hadn't done that, and you were reading Isaiah 61, verse 2, you wouldn't know where to stop, would you? You wouldn't know that there is a, is a span of 2,000 years between Lord and and, <coughs> separated by a comma. <coughs> Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. And it's not some arbitrary thing that men do. He did that. Right. He read it, got to that point, shut it, and handed it back to him. Yeah. And he said, now is this scripture fulfilled right. in your sight. And, of course, they couldn't accept that because is this not Joseph, the carpenter's son? He said, You will surely say unto me, Prophet, heal thyself. And a prophet hath no honor in his own country, among his own kinsmen, kinsmen and so forth. So the sixth chapter of Isaiah 
is taken by the Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ himself and quoted time and time and time again as it relates to Israel. Now, if uh, this is one of the reasons that I am premillennial, because it's, uh, uh, I, don't like, uh, I don't like created things as it relates to the Bible. Uh, for example, the word premillennial, the word amillennial, the word postmillennial, that's not in the Bible. Those words aren't in the Bible. For example, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. But our minds, our little, our little finite minds need some, some way to categorize things and put it together so we can understand it. If you've, I just showed you how that the Word of God, being alive, can only be interpreted by the Holy Spirit. I pray with all of my heart this morning that as a premillennialist that I have interpreted the Scripture correctly. But I will not take this Bible and beat it over the head of an amillennial or a postmillennial brother or sister and take the arrogant position that I am incapable of error. And I've heard plenty of that. I am fully capable of error. The reason that I come to the position of premillennialism is because there's so many passages in the Bible that I cannot make sense of unless I lay it out in an order like that. You see, an amillennialist and postmillennial, their position is that the church has replaced Israel. Essentially, that's their position because they believe in a final judgment. They believe the Lord's coming back, but they believe the Lord comes back and He puts the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand and He judges them. And that's it. But the problem with that is that the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, Romans 11, you've got to do something with it. Here's a scripture that says plainly, is God finished with a Jew? No. God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. And he said salvation is going to come to the Jew when the Lord roars out of Zion. And then he says all Israel shall be saved. Now you can do a number of things with that scripture. You can say, well, that happened in the first century. Or you can say, well, you know, Israel really means what he's talking about over there in the book of Romans when he says he is a Jew, which is not one outwardly, but one inwardly. So they redefine the term Jew, see. Or you can take it for what it says and say, well, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about Jews. Let's just leave it there. Now, I'm going to leave it there. But if I leave it there, what am I going to do with it? Where am I going to put it? Well, I've got to put it somewhere. Now, what I'm giving you now is what's called hermeneutics. They've got a big word for everything. And it simply means the interpretation of Scripture. That's what it means, to interpret the Bible. If you'll remember the two on the road to Emmaus when the Lord Jesus showed up in the book of Luke after his resurrection, after his resurrection, the Bible says that he opened the Scriptures to them. And they said, did not our heart burn within us? What had been to them a boring book, probably, came alive. And the reason it came alive is because the author of the book told them what he said, what he meant when he said it. And he opened it up for them. This is why he told them, he said, well, I must go away. And when I go, the Comforter will come and he will guide you into all truth. In other words, God as the Holy Ghost, because there's no difference. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, one God. Yes, sir. No, they didn't, brother. The average family couldn't even read. <laughs> oh, yeah, letters. For example, the Apostle Paul says, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You had two main, two main lines of interpretation of the Jewish text, Shemai and Gamaliel. Shemai was hard line, right down the line, verbatim, cross the T's, dot the I's, this is it. And Gamaliel was more, a little more liberal, and not liberal as it's used today. Don't, don't mistake that. Gamaliel was, and they had schools, the school of Gamaliel, the school of Shemai. And the school of Gamaliel was a little more liberal in the sense that uh, that the scripture means what it says and says what it means, but the interpretation of it is left up to God 
and the Holy Spirit as he applies it. This is why, if you'll remember, over there in the New Testament book of Acts, he argued with them. What did he say, what did he say to them? When they came to him and said, this man is preaching and all people are getting, you know, they're being converted. He's spreading this heresy among the Jews. What did he say? What did Gamaliel say? That's exactly what he's... See here? Did you hear what he said? That's a classic example of interpretation. And Gamaliel said... Now the Pharisees didn't. The Pharisee would have been, the line, would have been right down the line with Shammai. Chop his head off, stone him, hang him, get rid of him. Because he doesn't march to our tune. It's like when the King James Bible was translated. How many's ever read the prefatory to the King James Bible? You've read it? Who do you think they're talking about when they're talking about the brethren who accept nothing or anybody or anyone or anything except it's hammered out on their own anvil? You remember that? You ever read that? That's in the prefatory to the King James Bible, 1611. They're talking about brethren that if you don't march to their tune, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not legitimate. See? Who do you think they're talking about? Who put people in stocks when they came over here in this country? And uh, who, who burned, who burned uh, uh, Rebecca Nurse? Who hung Rebecca Nurse up there in Salem, Massachusetts? The Calvinists did, brethren. The Calvinists did. They certainly did. Now, there's a difference between a pilgrim, a pilgrim, a pilgrim. They had Calvinistic views, but there is a vast difference between the pilgrim and the Puritan. There's a difference. And I'm not saying Puritans, all Puritans went to hell. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm, not, I'm saying, for, for example, a lot of good things came from the Puritans. No question about that at all. And uh, we are to respect them greatly. But people differ in their interpretations. And Gamaliel was one who differed from Shammai. And even to this day, Judaism, when you say, what does a Jew believe? What Jew are you talking about? <laughs> You're not talking about one classification of Jews out here that believe the same thing. That doesn't exist. Not at all. You've got those Orthodox Jews over there right now who have the little twirl around the side of their head there where they don't round the corners of their head, according to the Old Testament Scripture, who believe that, to the, that the, legitimate govern, the, the, the legitimate governing body of Israel is a farce, that they have no right to do that. They're not Zionist. They believe that the Messiah must come back and establish his government here, you see. Big difference between, uh, between their interpretation of the Scripture and the Zionist. What's a Zionist? A Zionist is a Jew that believes that the Holy Land belongs to them and they need to go back and take it. And Theodore Herzl in Basel, Switzerland, late 1800s, did that very thing. For he convened the, convened the first Zionist Congress for the sole purpose of establishing once again a Jewish homeland. And I believe God was in it. I believe he did it. I believe he got them into the land where they are. All right. So now it is a matter of interpretation. Premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial. The premillennial believes before the millennium. Amillennial believes no millennium. Postmillennial believes after the millennium. There's a lot of differing views even in that. It's not a simple thing. It's not just this is postmillennialism. No, postmillennialism is like premillennialism. It's got a lot of variations in it. And same with the amillennial. So I'm premillennial in the sense that in order to understand the scripture, for me to understand it, it has to fit. It, it has to make sense. And I cannot make Israel the church, and I cannot make the church Israel. I believe that we have a place, and that place is the body of Christ that's made up of Jew and Gentile. And Twain, he said, she'll make one new man. And that's who we are today, but the church of God is made up of Jews, Gentiles, red, yellow, black, white, rich, poor, bond, free. Makes no difference throughout the ages. It's been no different. God, no respecter of persons. The apostle Peter was taught that lesson clearly when uh, he went in the house of Cornelius. God is no respecter of persons. So when I get the 11th chapter of Romans, I know that. I know it's true. I know these truths. I know these are, these are, these are, these are indisputable truths. Well, then, if that be true, when I get to the 11th chapter of Romans, what am I going to do with the Jew? If I make the Jew into the church, what have I done? What have I done? I can make it fit. I can create my own little man-made eschatology, and that's what, it, that's what it is. 
There's an eschat, it simply means a doctrine of land. Eschatos in Greek is the last. So eschatology is the last thing. So what have I done? If I've made the Jew the church, what have I done? Well, that's, sure, I mean, you, 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 uh, All right, let's look at a passage that will back up a lot of what you're saying. Go to Isaiah 11. All right, Isaiah 11. And verse 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Who's Jesse? Who is David's father? Jesse. Now, he's not the only Jesse. There's a bunch of Jesses, but he's David's father. All right. And we obviously we know this. We know this root of David. We know it is. We know it's Christ. We know he's coming forth, therefore, from this line. And in Matthew, it makes it plain, and so it does in Luke. Plain, and so it does in Luke. Now, here we go. Look at Isaiah 11, 11. If you look at verse 10, it says, In that day, keeps talking about that day, there shall be a root out of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Now watch this. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the isles of the sea. Has he done that yet? No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. No. No, he hasn't. Now, of course, we can go into the Old Testament and start looking at these scriptures that, rep that, uh, that have a ap direct application to the return of Israel, and we'll see that they are going to come back. Look at Zechariah. Zechariah. See, you've got to put these somewhere. Where, do this, where does this belong? In Zechariah 12, 9, he said, In that day, in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Israel. Remember the nations of the times of the Gentiles? Where does it fit? Where do we, where do we put it? Do we just spiritualize it? Or does it have a real place and time? Look at verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, good night. What is that? And they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his, one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, who pierced? Who was pierced? Who's doing the looking? He said, I'll pour upon the church, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Am I wrong? I have to ram the church in there. And does it make sense? Let's say that is the church. Let's just say it's the church. Why would the church be mourning? Why wouldn't the church be shouting and rejoicing? Why the morning? They say, where did you receive these wounds? Where did he say? Exactly. And you know what he called Judas Iscariot? Right before he kissed him? Friend. That sticketh closer than a brother. A friend. Judas Iscariot represented personally the rejection of Israel of the Messiah. He was a type of it. He was a type of it. That's exactly what he was. It was a picture of it happening. All right. Now, we've got to do something with these scriptures. When do they look upon him? All right. Now, look at this thing over here in, Isaiah, in, uh, in Romans 11. Look how the coming, look at the coming, how it, how, how it relates to Israel. Verse 25, Romans 11. For I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness is part, in part has happened to the church. 
Doesn't make sense, does it? So I'm going to keep Israel. Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all of the church shall be saved. See how foolish it is? See what's happening when you make Israel the church? And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. Now look at the salvation. It is associated with an event. There shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, the church is your enemy for, the, for its sake. See how messed up it gets? As concerning the gospels, they are. Israel are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. In time past, how not, you've not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through the church's unbelief. <laughs> of course, it's Israel. He rejoices in verse 33 because he has a deep, profound understanding of God's relationship to Israel. Look at the rejoicing. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out who hath known the mind of the Lord. So has God cast away his people which he did foreknow? Look at Romans 11. Verse 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. There's that foreknowledge. Watch you not what the scripture saith of Esaias, how he maketh, or Elias rather, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have digged, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Was he right or wrong? He was dead wrong. God sent him to one out there plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. <laughs> Elias, Elijah, and then Elias followed him. All right. Uh, had no idea that he went to plow that day, <laughs> what was going to be happening to him. So what's going on? Well, you have to forcefully, you have to manually force scriptures to make it line up with the idea of uh, Israel replace, the church replacing Israel. All right, now here we're, here we're faced with this conclusion. If the church has not replaced Israel in the prophecy relating to Israel, then that means that God's not finished with Israel. Obviously, if he's not finished with them, there's some, has, somebody has to be here that has that identity. They have to identify themselves as Israel. Is there a place on earth identified as Israel? Are there people in that country identified as Jews? Do they walk the streets of Jerusalem and if Isaiah showed up, could they converse with him? You better believe it. Isaiah could understand every word they said. And to me, that's profound. Everything they said, Isaiah could say it. Now, when Pontius Pilate sent a letter back to Augustus Caesar, the two of them would converse or whoever happened to be. Why? Because they conversed in Latin. Latin's a mother tongue. Remember that. It's a mother tongue. Because French, Portuguese, Italian, and Spanish came from Latin and probably some other dialects of it. But nobody speaks Latin today. It's called a dead language. But it's not really dead because it's the mother tongue of all these other languages. But Hebrew is so much older than Latin. So much older. And people are speaking Hebrew right now. They're speaking a language that is well over 4,000 years old. English is a modern thing. It's a baby language. It has three distinct periods. You have Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. And do you know what? Do you know when Modern English started? <clears throat> Very few of us could handle Old English. It's like German. You've got German, you've got Dutch, you've got Swiss, and a lot of other dialects of it. They're all akin to each other. They're first cousins. But English is kin to German. And if you get into Old English, you'd think sometimes you were reading German. They're so close. And it's not easy. Then you've got Middle English when it begins to transform and change and develop into its own language. And then Modern English. And you know when Modern English started? 
I'll give you a guess. 1611. <laughs> That's stuff you hear out there on the street today is pig Latin. <laughs> Amen. How many of you believe that this Bible is eloquent? That it uses words that are powerful? It, it's not wordy either. You know, it doesn't run on with run on sentences. When it says something, it says it in a clear, distinct fashion. Our problem is we just need to get us a dictionary and find out what those words mean that we don't use anymore. <laughs> Amen. So God's not finished with Israel. They're there as a result of prophecy. Bible being fulfilled, and if they are, I've got to do something with them. If I do not believe the church has replaced Israel, I believe the church is a separate body. I believe Israel, therefore, has a place in God's prophecy. I believe they have a reason for existence, and I believe they're going to be here on this earth. In Revelation chapter number 7 and 14, you'd be amazed at how they do the 144,000. Did you know that Joseph, uh, what was his name, Joseph Taz Russell, uh, Charles Taz. Charles Taz Russell in the 1800s, and a lot of stuff was born in the 1800s. You'd be amazed at how much stuff came out of the 1800s, the 19th century. Russell taught that 144,000 represented the ones that would go to heaven. Where did he get that from? He got it from chapter 7 Revelation, chapter 14 of Revelation. I told you how in chapter number 7 Revelation, they're on the earth. Then in chapter 14 of Revelation, where are they? They're in heaven. Who are they? Well, they're 12,000 from the 12 tribes of the church. I'll ask you a question. If it's the church, what tribe are you from? What's your tribe? Just pick one. <laughs> well, of course we don't know what tribe we're from because we're not from a tribe. We're Gentiles, alienated from God, without God out in the world and without hope. He said in the Old Testament, he said, I'll make them my people which were not my people. In the book of Hosea, he uses the illustration of lo Ami, lo Rahama, and uh, what's the name of that third one that's born? The three children born to Gomer. But anyway, lo Ami means not my people. That's what it means. Lo in Hebrew negates it. It said lo, no. Just remember it like that. Ami is people. Ami. So lo Ami means not my people. He said, I will make them my people who are not my people. That's me. <laughs> I got in. All right. So the, the, the idea is very clear that he is not finished with Israel. Israel is not the church. The church is a mystery body that was revealed to the apostle Paul. Though the Lord talked about the church, Matthew 16, he said, Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't define it. He didn't open up its essence. He did not do that. He saved that for Paul to do. And the Apostle Paul is the one who defined it. He defined what it was, what it meant, what it was about. And then the mysteries were given to him. And one of the great mysteries of the church is called the mystery of the rapture, the catching away of the saints. This is why he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we should be changed. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, the dead in Christ, he said, uh, he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, has any of this made any sense? I'm not only trying to tell you what the Bible says, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to show you how to come to that position. You know, you can give a man potatoes and you can give him beans and feed him, but if you really want to feed him, you'll teach him how to till the ground. You'll teach him how to raise his own crops, right? You certainly will. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show you how you can study the Bible and come to these conclusions yourself. Do I break fellowship with a man if he's amillennial? No. One of the best preachers I know of is an amillennial. Or post, whichever, I don't know if it's his, which one of his positions, and he's one fine preacher. But I don't agree with him on eschatology. Yes, sir.
I read a thing one time, a man said that, uh, and it's, when I read it, I thought, uh, let me give some thought to this. He said, there's nobody on, on this earth that can touch the soil and make it produce like a Jew. That God's given them a gift like that. And the land of Israel, he said, it's, he said that is the most fertile land on earth and all it needs is water. If yes. You go on Google Earth and look at Israel, you, can, you don't need to, to know where the Wet Bank is or the Gaza Strip. Just look at the. Which side's water. green? <laughs> one's gray and one's green. <laughs> you need an underground water supply, I came out of the Sinai Desert and went into the land of Israel personally. I've been there. And it's like leaving, it's like leaving the moon and coming to the earth. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, here's the thing. There's a systematic effort in this country to expunge God from every, uh, from every public place. And in order to do that, they have to, uh, they have to destroy the foundation, which is the Bible. And Charles Darwin tried to do that in the 1800s with uh, Darwinism, which is Neoplatonism, is all it was. But he tried to do that by destroying the foundations of the Bible, casting doubt in the mind of people because of the creation in Scripture, whereas they believe it's a long process of evolution. And so they tried to unite the two together, which is called theistic evolution in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It went into the colleges and universities, the Bible colleges, seminaries, and universities. And it's been seed that's been planted for over 100 years, and now you're seeing the fruit of it. You're seeing the fruit of it. They give lip service to God but the God they're talking about is not your God, the Lord Jesus Christ, not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This country right now is post-modern, they call it. It's past the point of, uh, of rejection of Christ. No, it's way past that. Now it's reaping the fruits of what happens when a nation is godless. And that's what went on up there in, uh, in Newtown, in uh, Connecticut, when this monster, demon-possessed monster went in there and shot to death little six- and seven-year-old children, little girls that play with their dolls, little children. That's a monster. There are murderers at Brushy Mountain that wouldn't do that. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Crying in the wilderness, and you refer to Matthew, the book of Matthew. What is so amazing is that that verse in Isaiah comes on chapter in verse three. If you go to Matthew, the fortieth book in the Bible, verse three. Forty-three and forty-three line up, huh? Okay. <laughs> the third, the third chapter, third verse. Okay. It, it quotes the same thing. Uh, it's, it's there's a number of times in the Bible that that happens. And the chapters and verses, you know, were not written in the original text. Something's added later. <laughs> and, <laughs> Folks, the book's the book. You need to love it, read it, study it, pray over it. This is God's Word. And it's, and it's not the Word of men. It, if, if a man wrote that Bible, he was insane. <laughs> Because that Bible never paints man in a good light. <laughs> it doesn't. That's right, brother. We're reaping a harvest now. I mean, it, it was somebody, somebody went into a church. Some lady was in there. She had food. Their pastor had died of 58 years. She had brought food to the church up in Pennsylvania. She brought food to the church. 
This maniac goes through the door and shoots her dead and then kills two or three other people and they call the police in, police show up and he starts shooting them and they had their vest and protected them and didn't die. That happened just last week in Pennsylvania. And I mean, that's just the latest because it's continuing on, 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 and on. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen. That's what Wayne Lapeer said. He said you need to put an armed guard in every schoolhouse in the country. He's caught all kinds of flack for that and criticism. All right, let's go to the 35% of the schools that do have armed guards. Yes. What's going on? You going to criticize them? They've already got 30, 30, a third of the schoolhouses already have armed guards. Yes, sir. The kids are smart. I think the teachers ought to all, they should give, every one of them should be taught what a weapon is, how to use that weapon, how to keep it clean, how to, how to you know, you, you got to know what you're doing with a weapon. Yeah. But I agree, the teachers should be armed. Right. Everybody in this church knows full well the problem ain't who's got guns. The problem is who's got God. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yes, sir. I agree That's with that. Problem. It's not about guns. It's about your, your callous needs. Most people don't have callous needs anymore. I agree. They need to be praying, absolutely. But guns don't kill people. People kill people. And uh, what? The heart does from how the heart issues forth murders. No, no. A teacher would be better off, far better off, I think, with a weapon. I do. Yes, sir with a weapon, but they got to learn how to use it, folks. In the last two years, there have been two deputy sheriffs shot themselves, one in Anderson County and one in Knox County, cleaning their weapon. Now, that's mind-boggling. Here's somebody that's carrying a weapon and doesn't have any more sense than to shoot themselves, cleaning a, a loaded weapon. Yes, sir. Well, I don't know what they're... They don't, I mean, I, I, I'm an expert with weapons. We shoot all the time. And most cops, I, I know a one, one deal where a cop tried to shoot his weapon and didn't fire because it was corroded, because it's never been cleaned, it's never been yeah. out of his holster. So, well, you know, you, yeah, that's... that's that, that gets into policy of the local police forces and stuff. They, they need to be proficient. They need to know what they're doing for certain. We'll have a word of prayer and let you go. We've run out of time. Brother, will you dismiss?